Guys, I'd like to give you all a very warm welcome. Um, thank you so much for coming. So this is uh, an interesting event. It's a regular time for a physics colloquium, but it's also the first of a series of seminars of a consortium of people at UTG called MINT. And so all of the people speaking today, the first talks will be graduate students who have been at UTD just about a year working on this project, some a little more, some a little less. And so the whole idea of MINTS is a very holistic observation program. So the idea, um, when I say holistic, that means on multiple scales, from the global scale, from satellite measurements, and then from the, on the very local scale with helicopters and planes like you'll see some of which are demonstrated later. Then holistic also means of multiple parameters. So today you'll see actually our first video, high definition video, which was taken from this helicopter. But in addition, there's thermal imaging and a hyperspectral camera, camera and a synthetic aperture radar. And this holistic also means for a whole variety of processes, from agriculture just behind us, uh, the fence behind UTD on Waterview Parkway, there's the Texas A&M Agricultural Extension. There's a gentleman from there with us today. And we hope to be flying over some of the plots that they're going to specially plant for us from agricultural related projects. It's also for geophysical prospecting, um, for fires, um, for environmental air quality to do um, neighborhood scale public health issues with a whole suite of sensors. In fact, there are some people just coming this evening for tomorrow, our first test flight um, in Princeton. They developed these small laser-based sensors that we're going to have our first test flight hopefully with tomorrow. So it's on a variety of applications, all of which have societal relevance. But then in addition to that, we also couple this with machine learning to help address decision support issues. So that could be uh, the agriculture one I mentioned, or it could be the public health one, but also we have another talk today you'll see looking at classifying the ecosystems in the Gulf of Mexico. So that could be related for um, where it's best to have conservation zones on the one side, or on the other hand, um, to help the fishermen where to find the best shrimp. Um, also for detecting oil spills. So you're beginning to see that this multi-scale integrated really is multi-scaled and integrated, but it's also intelligent. So the idea is we don't just make observations anywhere, but we use our information on the situation to help us focus the observations, to make them at the optimum places and time. So you'll see that also in the first talk that Alan will give about tornado forecasting. Um, and so it's really uh, multi-scale, integrated, intelligent, and interactive. So some of this direction of these robotic vehicles will be real time. So for example, for sniffing out gas leaks, you can think that this platform can become like an aerial sniffer dog for a gas leak, for example. So there's a whole suite of things using physics, computing, um, and our consortium of MINTS involves faculty from four departments and two different schools. Physics, geophysics, electrical engineering, um, and computer science. So if any of the topics you hear you find interesting and you're interested to collaborate, we love to collaborate. We're already a very collaborative group. So um, the plan for today is we'll have three talks, then we'll stretch our legs and go outside before it gets dark to have a test flight. And Dave Schaefer will tell us a bit about the platforms, and we've really appreciated his help in building these. Um, and then we'll come back for the last three talks. So I hope you really enjoy it and it'll be a pleasurable time for you. So let me introduce Alan who will <coughs> take over now. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Alan Harrison. I joined uh, Dr. Larry's group this past May. 
And today I'm going to give you a brief introduction on tornado forecasting using severe weather area robotic measurements. But first, why do we need to forecast tornadoes? Well, tornadoes are some of the most powerful forces in nature. And looking at this map that depicts every tornado that formed in 2010, we can see that they occur everywhere across the 48 contiguous states. They can also form at any time of year. The bar graph down here shows the number of tornadoes per month, and you can see that every month had at least one tornado formation. They are, however, most likely to occur in the central U.S. and during the spring. So a few quick statistics. For 2010, the National Weather Service reported over 1,200 tornadoes, which traveled more than 4,000 miles and caused $1.1 billion in property damage. As of August of this year, they have already reported over 1,700 tornadoes causing 549 fatalities, making this the fourth deadliest year on record, just short of the second place spot, which had 552 uh, fatalities. Now, one of the reasons for so many fatalities is that we do not have an adequate warning system. Currently, you only have about a 13-minute warning on a tornado. Now, that time period is so short that residents in an affected area are told not to leave where they are just to take shelter the best they can, which makes people in buildings without a storm shelter especially vulnerable. Now one of the reasons for such a short warning is that we still rely on a network of trained spotters out in the field looking for a few key characteristics of a possible tornado formation, and more importantly, looking for tornadoes that are already on the ground. But what are they looking for? Here's a cross-section of a uh, parent storm known as a mesocyclone. One of the key things they're looking for is this area known as a wall cloud, this anvil, and this overshooting top. The overshooting top in particular is a sign of a very powerful updraft drawing in power from a warm, moist gust front. <clears throat> Some very key regions are the forward flank and rear flank downdrafts, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Now, here is an artist rendition of what this might look like out in the field. Uh, you can see the wall cloud and the anvil and overshooting top. And if you look how small the tornado looks, you can get an idea of how large these systems are. <clears throat> Storms naturally have a vertical vorticity. But for a tornado to form, that needs to be tilted into horizontal vorticity, which will happen in an updraft. But an updraft alone is not enough to form a tornado. You need the tornado formation, the tilting to occur at the ground level which is where the downdraft comes in. It forces the air down towards the ground, so it tilts at ground level, and then the tornado forms from the ground up. And that's what makes this downdraft area so vital. <clears throat> so again, the forward flank and rear flank downdrafts are vital to tornado genesis. They also happen to be areas that, unfortunately, are not studied very often right now. <clears throat> Now, if we look at a few storms to get an idea of how large and powerful these systems are, this is one that formed here in Texas. You can see the wall cloud and the anvil, uh, and then looking at this tree, you can get an idea of how large this is. Here's another funnel with a lot of debris that has been picked up that is traveling along with the tornado, which really increases the potential for destruction. And down here is a house, so you can get an idea of how large that is and how much debris is floating around. <clears throat> this is the one that formed near Jasper this last spring that you may remember from the news. And here's a before and after image of a neighborhood that it went through. And you can see there's pretty much nothing left in that tornado track. Going in a little closer, you can see the houses are reduced to what looks like matchsticks piled up. And then another image along the track, you can see all but the sturdiest buildings were pretty much destroyed. Now, if you only have a 13-minute window, which is not enough time to get out, and you don't have a storm shelter, you can see that you really are in a lot of danger. With a longer warning time, then these people can seek sturdier shelters, such as in this hospital. <clears throat> Tornadoes can also just pick cars up and toss them around like hot, like hot wheels, so you don't want to be caught on the road. And then finally, one of the most famous tornadoes. I think I'll know how that ended. <clears throat> So how do we currently study tornadoes? Well, currently, you have stationary research facilities. 
vehicle-based observations known as mobile mesonets, aerial measurements, and computer simulations. The stationary research facilities are where your wide field Doppler weather radar are located. They also have sensors for measuring temperature, pressure, and humidity, but they're, per they're permanent structures. So the likelihood of a tornado tracking by one of these facilities to get the measurements we need is very low. Doppler weather radar has done a lot to increase the accuracy of warning, uh, monitoring and predictions. But Doppler weather radar itself cannot directly image the tornadoes. This is a radar image of several storms with tornadoes on the ground indicated by the arrows. And as you can see, you cannot really see a difference between the tornadoes and their parent storms. <clears throat> so to get the measurements that we need, you have to go out to the tornadoes. To this end, the Vortex and Vortex 2 project were created. Uh, these projects took a full weather station with sensors for measuring temperature, pressure, humidity, and wind speed, strapped to the roof of a car, and drove out to, to the tornadoes. Now, they got a lot of useful data, but they were still limited to the road system. And since people had to drive the car, you had to be overly cautious about keeping a safe distance from the storm. So they didn't really measure in those downdraft areas that we need. Aerial measurements are used quite often. Balloons have been used for over 100 years now. But unfortunately, balloons don't have a propulsion or navigation system. You have to just release them and let the winds blow where they may. And if those winds happen to be very strong downdrafts, well, then your balloon gets blown out of the area you can be measured. <clears throat> Planes also quite often get used. This is an AWACS with a Doppler weather radar. This is used to monitor storm systems from above. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the Doppler radar cannot image the tornadoes directly. So along with that, you can use what's known as a drop song. This is a can-shaped device with sensors for measuring temperature, pressure, and humidity. Uh, it has an integrated GPS receiver to geotag the data that it records. You release them from a plane, they descend on a small parachute down through your system. And again, no navigation, so you cannot take targeted measurements. Also, any system using a plane, you have to you have to fly, uh, file a flight plan to get FAA clearance before you can take off. Now, that takes time, and these systems develop very rapidly, so you quite often miss your storm. So systems like this tend to be used for longer life storms, such as hurricanes. <clears throat> now, once you have your data, then you can run your computer simulations to uh, test theories or predict how a storm is going to evolve. Uh, the two most prevalent systems right now are the weather research and forecasting model and the advanced regional prediction system. Uh, the ARPS was uh, developed with the University of Oklahoma, and we will be collaborating with Dr. Howard Bluestein from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, he is renowned as one of the world's foremost authorities on tornadoes, so we have a lot of uh, knowledge working with them. So what are we looking at doing? Well, we are developing a fleet of fully autonomous aerial robots. Well, the portion of the fleet I'm using is based on the T-Rex 700, uh, which is a very popular acrobatic helicopter designed to perform aggressive 3D maneuvers. Uh, I've actually got its current configuration here, which we'll show later. And now to do the acrobatic maneuvers, it requires a very high power to weight ratio, which for us means that it is fully capable of carrying the sensors that, we, that we'll use on it. To control it, we'll use the uh, Micropilot MP2128 Autopilot System, a system designed to be able to fly a complete mission from takeoff to landing autonomously. You can set waypoints with uh, GPS and altitude, and then you can change those waypoints on the fly. Uh, just shortly, Brian Roscoe will discuss how we're going to control that system so that each member of our fleet can determine which member needs to be deployed to a given location to get the measurements we need. For our measurements, we'll use the New Mountain Innovations MET sensor, which is a complete weather station with sensors for measuring temperature, pressure, humidity, as well as wind speed and direction using four ultrasonic transducers. It has its own integrated GPS so that it can extract the true wind speed from the apparent as well. <coughs> now our fleet will be versatile. Uh, as I mentioned, I will be taking weather measurements. Brian Nathan will be discussing shortly several other uses, including a laser scanner, a trace gas sensor, and, and uh, thermal imaging. So again, as I mentioned earlier, the two vital areas are the forward flank and rear flank downcrafts. 
looking at a top-down view, we can see that they each have about a five kilometer footprint. And so we will design our helicopters to deploy and autonomously sample the thermodynamics of those regions. Now I've talked a lot, of that, a lot today about why it's important to uh, forecast tornadoes and how we're gonna get our measurements. And at this early stage, that's really what we're mostly focused on. But that leaves one important question. Well, we know that these systems are fully governed by the principles and laws of thermodynamics and fluid dynamics. And once we get a chance to go out in the field, which we hope to do this summer and gather our data, then those are the physical properties that we will investigate. Thank you very much.